translate. <laughs> so I, I call everybody your star. You know, I said, oh, your star, your star. And Lindsay was saying that an Irish librarian who was recently spent time with the archives was saying that to people too. And I was like, oh, is that, oh, that's not what he said. Oh, okay. <laughs>
pioneering work on the Beat Irish. And Dr. Edmund's research is one of the best known explorations of an Irish American community. He traced Irish immigrants' backgrounds in Ireland, explored how they built an ethnic community in use, analyzed the natures and hazards of their work in the copper mines, and he also examined the complex, which John was actually talking to me about before the talk, the complex interplay between Irish nationalism and worker consciousness. And even just the interplay between the different Irish organizations is in itself fascinating. The Irish Act primary source documents at the archives, they expand our understanding of that Irish experience in use in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And they reveal a vibrant Irish-speaking community and, sheds, and it sheds new light on their cultural history here in this town. So storytelling and singing are at the heart of Irish culture. Scholars believe that Irish traditional music first came to the country in the Celts 2,000 years ago, so quite a while ago. And it began as an oral tradition, passed down from generation to generation by listening, learning by ear, and without formally writing out tunes on paper or in manuscripts. And it wasn't until 1762 that the tunes were officially written down for the first time. And collectors began to travel Ireland uh, compiling music that we can still access and play to this day. And the types of stories and songs have changed drastically over the course of Irish history. So if we go way back, the pre-Christian texts, so before the 5th century, they include mythologies, stories about a pagan military force and their deities or gods, collectively known as Fenyaf. Has anybody heard of Fenyaf stories, perhaps? Irish mythological tales, I know. As well as a series of tales centering on figures from Ireland's northeast, known as the Ulster Cycle. And sadness from the Christian period focus on national or provincial kings or on the saints. And that was around the period of 600 to 900 AD to 900 AD, and in the Middle Irish and later medieval phase, which was 900 to 1200 AD, storytelling was adapted into Irish from Greek, Latin, Anglo-Normal French, and English. Now, pre-1650 in Ireland, and I mentioned that date very specifically, and I'll circle back to it in a second, poetry was used for various purposes. It primarily played an advisory, celebratory, or instructional role in society. And concerns of the aristocracy and the upper class are paramount in all of this material. But as the language receded from the upper class, so from the time the English established control over Ireland, so 60 and 50 onwards, the literature of a disenfranchised community came to the fore. And vision poetry, called Ashling in Ireland, abounded and compositions increasingly focused on the peasant, rural, or marginalized society. And these poems and songs gave glimpses into a flourishing folk and an oral tradition. So why I'm telling you about this is that if we look at the Bear Peninsula in the 19th century, yes, so here down in the southwest little corner here to the country is the Bear Peninsula that I've circled here. So a tiny peninsula on an already small island. Um, but this was the place from, and a time in which, so the 19th century, many would emigrate from Bera to Bute. And the poetry these emigrants practiced at, at, in Ireland was Filiacht Tua, or countryside or peasant poetry. And it was not usually recorded on paper or a manuscript. Poets composed primarily for their own community, leaving it often to chance whether the pieces ever spread even beyond their own parish boundaries. And although these regional composers had little, if any, formal education at all, they really were vessels of knowledge, tradition, and their own history. <coughs> and their first craft was actually really highly sophisticated. And in 1939, an Irish folklore collector, who was called Ty Gomerhu, he interviewed a local woman in one of the regions of Bear called Kilcatherine, and it's in the northwest area of the peninsula. And this woman suggested to Gomerhu that poetry came as easily as prose to the lips of Kilcatrin residents. So storytelling was also immensely popular in Vera in the 19th century. And the telling of tales at that time, a very difficult period of Irish history, right, the 1800s, that storytelling was an oral literature of escape. So one scholar declared, for an hour or two, the oppressed and downtrodden could leave the grinding poverty of their surroundings and in their imaginations, they could rub shoulders with the great ones again. 
and sup with the kings and queens and the lords and the ladies in the courts of Maryland. And there were many local poets and storytellers of repute living in the Bear Peninsula during the late 19th century. Many of these people emigrated to the United States and to Butte. And one particular example is Sean Irish O'Sullivan. And he was born on the 20th of June, 1882, on an even smaller island than Ireland <laughs> uh, called Inish Farn Ireland. And it's off the northwest coast of the Bear Peninsula, in that parish that I mentioned, Kilcatherine, um, in the townland of Aries and County Cork. And so, just to give you an idea, this is just a quick snapshot of Kilcatherine Parish in the Bear Peninsula, which is here. And this is the island, English Brian Irish, off the coast. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say teeny tiny island. Oh, good. And I'll just give you the dimensions just so you really get a really good idea. So it measures 1.2 miles long and a quarter of a mile wide. <laughs> so you knew your neighbor was real well. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> match. living on this island off the coast of Ireland in the 1800s. He was minimally educated, and he was an, an, a minimally educated exile in Ireland, but he would become one of the most respected and prominent leaders, supporting the Irish language and its cause at a pivotal period in both Buttes and Ireland's history. He was, I'm not sure photo of him as well, so this is a picture from mm -hmm. the Catherine Point looking out onto the island. Mm -hmm. And this is Sean here on the left, a really nice photo that was taken of him in his early days in Butte. And here he is with his wife Josie, and his daughter Bernie, and oh. Eamon. Wow. And here he is with his two sons, Eamon and Father Sarsfield, who many of you may, may perhaps have known or at least heard of in Butte. <laughs> so Sean's father was a fisherman, like all the other men basically on the island. And life purely was tough. They were dependent on mainland villages for turf and amenities. And there were limited, as I said, educational opportunities for the children on the island. Sean did say that he attended school to the American equivalent of eighth grade, likely the mainland school. But it was sporadic at best, their attendances. The islanders were all Irish speakers. And you can imagine if you're all an Irish speaker on that island, right? It's so remote. So you're speaking Irish every single day. You're just steeped. In, in the storytelling and singing. So they were all Irish speakers, speakers, and his childhood was just steeped in that oral tradition of poetry, song, songs, and stories that told their history. So his grandfather was a real character. He was known as Shana Michal, which means Old Michael. And he composed many songs about what was happening in the area at the time. And one of his songs, Rosh Navalia, which was Castletown Boat Races, it was frequently heard being sung by their Bera emigrants in America in the early 20th century. So, you know, a guy who lived on that tiny island, right? So it was heard amongst Irish, Irish emigrants in the US singing in the early 20th century. An Irish poet and journalist who had emigrated to the US in the late 1800s, <clears throat> he actually wrote it down from two brothers who had emigrated to the US and, and had learned it growing up and then continued singing it in the United States. And he published that song in an Irish American newspaper, The Gaelic American. And it even made its way to a Canadian journal. So that tells you something about the journey of the song, right? Sean's favorite part of the song was when it describes his grandfather as no lackey. Instead, he's described as a true Catholic and descendant of Donald Camp of Sullivan, who was an Irish soldier and who was known as the last independent chief of the O'Sullivan clan in Ireland. And for this reason, Sean's son, Father Sarsfield, had the following line inscribed on Sean's headstone in Holy Cross Cemetery. Beer Gaeg o Donal o Sullivan Oog. True descendant of young Donal o Sullivan. Mm -hmm. And although it had not entirely disappeared, use of the Irish language by native speakers was dwindling throughout the late 19th century. Beer was not immune to this shift. But conversely, 
in the face of this linguistic shift and population decline at the same time, came one of the more remarkable developments in Ireland's contemporary history. And that was the growth of organizations seeking to reverse those trends, right? And that of language change specifically. And so, when young married men and women, such as Sean, began looking overseas for employment, especially to American mining towns like Butte, where you got $4 a shift, right, per, uh, per mining shift, and that was nearly double um, other, <coughs> other uh, pay in other mining towns. When these young men and women started looking here, they were already steeped in Ireland's history, culture, language, and the revival of their culture was at the forefront of their minds as they left their shores too. So when Sean arrived in 1905, what a city he arrived into, right? Having left that tiny island right off the coast, the coast of Beira, he left that to an industrial modern city right here. And Butte had advantages where the Irish immigrants few other American cities could match. The Irish established a dominant position here from the town's foundational days. Marcus Daly had sent word out, and many of you I'm sure have heard of Marcus Daly's name, that jobs were available for the Irish, and they were one of the first ethnic groups to arrive in substantial numbers in the 1870s. And the town was just about to take off at that time. And so the Irish could then weave themselves into Butte society at all the different levels, so they could become laborers, merchants, businessmen, join the police force which wasn't something that they could really do on the East Coast. So word soon got out to the Irish in the US and to cousins, like second cousins, third cousins removed, everyone, right? <laughs> in the US and back in Ireland about the incredible opportunities that were available to them in Butte that they could get to actual jobs, right? And so the Irish kept coming. And of course, ethnic groups from all over the world began arriving to this melting pot. Croatians, Germans, Finns, Italians, Chinese, Cornish, Hispanic, and Jewish. And thanks to the staff at the Beats of Before Archives, uh, you can learn more about the different ethnic groups that have beautifully put together a really interesting exhibition and at the Benai Israel Temple here in town. By 1905, there were more Irish here than any other ethnic group, and I'm sure many of you have heard that, but 25% of the residents of Silver Bowl County were from Ireland. And when the former Irish president, Douglas Hyde, visited the city in 1906, just after Sean arrived, he arrived in 1905, the Irish president described the city as Car Erinach Gilnach, his Erinach Gil, and Kudismol the Nadina, and Tawhinchi, August Pasturu Gachrod, Erlo, and Erinach. So he came away from visiting the youth saying, Wow, that was essentially an Irish town. Most of the people there are Irish, and the Irish want everything which was not something you'd say about many towns in America at the time. <laughs> Therefore, the freedom the Irish and Butch enjoyed to build their world resulted in neighborhoods among the most cohesive, ethnically speaking, throughout industrializing America. So, what did the Irish do? They did lots of things, right? They didn't just work. They also established cultural organizations. So, when Sean arrived in, in 1905, he arrived to a town where Gaelic football had been played as early as 1892. And you can read here a little excerpt on that. Then beginning in 1895, the Irish political organization, the Robert Emmett Literary Association, which John also mentioned to me earlier, they were really not a literary association. <laughs> they, had, they had lots of different objectives. One of them, though, was they were holding regular Irish lectures in Butte in the early days. And a local branch of the Gaelic League was formed here in this town in 1906. And the League was first established in Ireland in 1893. And its overarching goal, basically, was to revive the Irish language and culture. So that happened in Ireland in 1893. But the League's Irish language outreach extended to the United States as to other countries that had substantial Irish exile populations. And it found really fertile ground in the United States. Research on the Irish language in New York highlights that the Irish American newspaper had been publishing a Gaelic commune as early as the 1850s and 60s. So 40 years before the Gaelic League was even established in Ireland, right? Gaelic language was being published here in the United States. Which is, yeah, pretty, pretty fascinating. These communes contained a vast array of Irish language and songs to cater, obviously, to the large immigrant population from Ireland. 
So once the league was established in Butte in 1906, it held dances, fashion at Kyol. Anybody know what a fashion Kyol is? There's lots of them happening in Butte this weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. They are the dances, right? Mm -hmm. Irish dances, the fesh. So you see lots of dancers, lots of amazing Irish dancers all weekend. And they also held, the league also held history and language classes. And then after these Gaelic League meetings, or their classes in the early 1900s, members then held elaborate Irish language entertainments. So these sessions, so this is another picture of the Wolf Tones, who were a uh, team here in 1911. All of you very dapper and fit. So the entertainment sessions that the Gaelic League held from 1907 really onwards uh, included traditional Irish songs that, that some of you may have heard of, such as Sean O'Farrell, Fire from the Shores of Finnish Fall, and many songs in the Irish language too. And the entertainments contained Irish dancing, lectures, lectures on topics of Irish history and culture. And men and women led the organization through its heyday from 1907 up to 1915. And children were also participants in the sessions often singing Irish language songs. So every year, from 1908 up to 1914, at least, Butte's Gaelic branch put on an annual Fesh Kyo, so just, as what, just like what's happening this weekend here still today, or a music festival. And this Fesh Kyo permitted youngsters to demonstrate their knowledge of their ancestors' tongue and culture. And the Fesh would be held every November at the Broadway Theatre, becoming one of the highlights of the Irish social calendar. And all members of the youth community, regardless of ethnicity, were invited. So it's notable that in 1910, at the Fesh Kyo that year, there were Irish, Scottish, American, and German flags on display at the theater. And the league printed programs for the Fesh too. And this extant 1912 copy of Fesh pamphlet, pamphlet provides us really great insight into the schedule and the contents of the evening's events. So the program was produced by Oates and Roberts, who are printers here in Butte, and the publication's title page includes the, the text, No Language, No Countries. And that's most likely in deference to the sentiments of a group um, in Ireland called Young Irelanders. And Thomas Davis and his comrade, who many of you may have heard of, Thomas Francis Marr, were members of the Young Irelanders. And it's accompanied by an Irish phrase also down here. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, up at the top. Uh, the con gloria de uh, Sonora de Heron. And it's translation into English, the glory of God and the honor of Ireland. And the <coughs> statement, which is here, that right here bold, the 700,000 children uh, now studying the language of Ireland. So that's in reference to the fact that the members of the Butte branch of the Gaelic League we're sending home money every single year from 1908 to 1914 and possibly longer, we just can't trace it, to fund traveling teachers who would instruct the Irish language to the Irish community at home in Ireland. Right? Just, and this was before Ireland had even gained its independence. Right? In 1913, the Butte branch of the Gaelic League sent home $1,500 to fund that position in Ireland. So as I mentioned, the Gaelic League also established an Irish language school for its members. So why was a school needed, right, in Putin, an Irish language school at that? Well, Sean, for example, he spoke really rich, really nuanced language, but as I said, it was an oral tradition in Ireland, right, and he had very minimal education, so he was effectively illiterate in his mother tongue. But it was here in Putin that he first learned to read and write in his native language. And here is... Just a picture of one of his Irish language practice books um, that he would practice his grammar in. And if any of the learners, the Irish language learners here, looking at this practice page might be sweating. <laughs> it's not an easy language to learn, but there is a he's doing that all very diligently, writing out all his rules of initial mutations in Irish language there. Uh, just a few years later, Sean himself was then teaching Irish language classes to others in the community. And so he was imparting his rich knowledge of his native tongue to young and old. And he also performed regularly at the Gaelic meetings and the special at Yol that I mentioned. And so it's no surprise that he meant earned the nickname Sean Irish along the way. 
And it's thanks to his membership in the UPAP and those language classes that he began writing down the hundreds of songs and stories that he had memorized from his youth on a tiny island of English in Ireland. And he transcribed songs from his childhood in several notebooks that he then preserved for his children. And that we now have today, right, to learn about what was happening in both in the early and 20th century. Sean also collected Irish songs that were printed in Irish American newspapers, and with his new literacy, literacy skills, he also put pen to paper and even composed some works himself. So many of the Irish arriving here in the late 1800s and early 1900s did not abandon their native heritage to assimilate into American society, which was a very, you know, uh, an, an approach that a lot of different ethnic communities took right once they moved here. And the Gaelic League, among other organizations, allowed the Irish to promote and cultivate their language and culture at a time when it was harder to do that at home in Ireland than it was here. And this was, at the time, uh, uh, so they were fighting for, at the time, um, Irish independence, basically a free country with its own language um, and heritage, reinstated. So outside of organizations, Irish language also flourished in boarding houses. So 10 young Irish immigrants, they're a really funny little group from Kirkenwina in County Kerry. They were really young, they came here, they stayed in a boarding house, Alexander McMahon's boarding house in 1910, and they were all native Irish speakers. And they continued to communicate with each other in their paternal tongue in use. And one of the boys stated, Waylon er father of English all Irish. We only spoke Irish. And in fact, such was the demand for Irish entertainment at the boarding houses that one of his friends, who was illiterate, would perform a song in Irish or a show in Irish in exchange for one of the other boys to read letters that he was getting from home. And these young Irish-speaking immigrants also composed new songs in the boarding houses in the East. And these songs weren't exactly what you call profound. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were Irish language songs that were being composed, right, in boarding houses amongst a young group of guys, right? They just arrived in this, this, this amazing industrial town. Lots of opportunities. So one of the boys, a poet, Sean Rochelle, he composed a song after playing a prank on one of his roommates, Sean Ganon. And Ganon was fiercely proud of this gold watch that he recently bought. And you know, you could never even imagine being able to buy a gold watch at the time in Ireland. So he was fiercely proud about it. He, you know, bought it after his or after he earned all that money at the mines. And one day, after we had left for a shift at the mines, his friend, the poet Sean Rochelle, hid the valuable timepiece. And so when Gunnar came home, he was beside himself when he realized that it was missing. And so he had a crazy over-the-top reaction about the missing watch. And his friends were just howling with laughter, making fun of him. And it inspired his friend, the poet Sean Rochelle, to then compose what we would call a humorous ditty, right? A small little piece about the event. And so it contains the following little lines in it. And and I'll read the Irish piece a little bit first. So, Fosgeni Bill Gatherin, and this is Jocker A. Vincent, a school in a watch and a guidex nina. Good bookery and dangin, fe vargos nina, shong and all, she a And that means we have, we have a little story that is hard to share on the back of the watches that are stolen in the night. That the dingle boys are howling and crying about. Shong and all is tormented and overcome. And that's the start of it. And then it just goes on and on. And there is just sarcasm littered throughout the entire piece. <laughs> um, I think he got his watch back at the end of the whole <laughs> um, Mines were also uh, places of rich transmission of songs between the Irish and between other ethnic groups, too. And a returning immigrant to Ireland gave insight into the reality and dynamics of different ethnic groups working side by side in the mines. In the early 1900s, his observations paint the mines not only as workplaces, but as multicultural hubs. So he said, what little English he, a friend of his, had, it was more than many others, such as the Polacks and Italians, working there. And they did their jobs with no English. The companies didn't care what language was being spoken, as long as the work was being done. And so it stands to reason that if the Irish language was being spoken, right, in amongst the miners, so there was surely Irish songs being sung and stories being told. The tunes sung in the mines during the golden age of singing um, in the mines, which was 
in the 1880s to 1920. <coughs> it ranged from songs that were old country songs such as hymns, carols, popular hits of the day, depending on the occasion. And of course, working in mind, you had incredible acoustics, right? So I'm here, he's a minor to Bob to start harmonizing with one another too. It was, a, it was a good group of them, so I mean, probably it was a great thing to hear. Miners also had their own songs, many of which were suffused with national fervor, but they took just as readily to other kinds, particularly to humorous tunes or anything that really helped them to pass the time underground in those times. And oftentimes, the traditional Irish songs were also sung in English. So for example, on St. Patrick's Day, it was common in the Irish lines to hear them singing The Wearing of the Green, God Save Ireland, Ireland Boys Array, and many other patriotic pieces. And then, when the occasion arose, some of those songs were then dressed up to fit a local situation. So for example, at election time, to the line of the song, The Wearing of the Green, there's a, there's a line in there that says, the harp that wants to Tara's Hall played many a silvery note. I am not going to sing it. <laughs> that you don't want it. So to that line, they hastily added, is played tonight in Dublin Gulch to catch the Irish boat. So these songs were also heard in the saloons, on the streets, and wherever else groups scattered. And the practice of singing in the mines had largely died out by the 1940s. According to old timers' testimonies, singing on any large scale did not date beyond the early years of the century, when the really seasoned hard rock men was a singing all the time, is what they said. Mm -hmm. Some argue that the advent of contract mining on a large scale in the mines of Butte had much to do with the decline of song underground about 1920 onwards. And women, either from Ireland or closely associated, associated with it, but who lived in Montana, also preserved their Irish heritage through song within this region. So one lady, and she's quite a elusive lady, Margaret Maggie Mooney, filled two notebooks with traditional Irish songs. Now it's not known for certain who Maggie was, but Sean, who, I, who I've been speaking about, he kept her notebooks, and so they were somehow connected perhaps over their interest in our songs. And Maggie's two notebooks are made up primarily of well-known nostalgic Irish verse. And one song she recorded, Come Back to Erin, calls immigrants back to their native shore. Mm -hmm. So it reads, come back to Erin, the morning, the morning, come back again to the land of the birth. Come with the shamrock at springtime of morning, and his Killarney shall bring with our breath. And these pieces, along with others, such as Kathleen Mavorny, Gary Owen, Seamus O'Brien, were often sung, um, often sung among Irish immigrants in the East. And I believe that Margaret Mooney's efforts solidified Sean's involvement, both with then writing down his own store of Irish language songs one year, and it also expanding his understanding of women's role in the transition process. And another friend of Sean's, a well-known poet, Seamus O'Mara Gertie, cemented Sean's appreciation of yet more possibilities. And in this case, it was the validity and worth of composing songs of one's own. So Seamus and Murray Kirk Has anybody heard of Seamus and Murray? He was about being fauna. Um, um, he, was a, he ended up being a well-known Irish poet writing here in the United States um, in the early 1900s. But he spent time in Butte and occupied a really prominent position in the political organizations and in the cultural organizations. And then he moved to California and that's where he really found his full voice and became a really accomplished composer. But he was a really good friend of Sean's while he was here. And Seamus wrote a variety of highly regarded Irish songs, a couple of which focused on complex international issues of the day. So for example, in one song, he addresses the fact that Irish immigrants are expected to join Americans and fight with the British in World War I. Very complex issue, right? He declares his opposition to conscription criticizes Irish pro-war politicians, and asks Irish exiles not to forget their ancestors who suffered. So I'll just read a little piece from it. A clan of Buxton and Wales, now gay and ship to ship ship and glory. Falling one day, a dog for Shinsher, log of Mara, fame goes. And their split us on flaw, the squeal of his go laugh, their got rose. And some bagoon from May, the gay and exhaw, their moors. So poor children of Gael, don't yield to their call. Take care of those who left their ancestors dead in the ground. Plague and famine released and spread down every road, and John eating the best of bacon at his table. And John was a name often used to refer to him at other times in songs. So just some complex 
interesting um, pieces being written by Seamus too. Youth's Irish language, language Belia inspired Sean to begin composing a collection of his own songs that focused on his life in youth and also in Ireland. So this here is an excerpt from one of his notebooks um, of a song, Ermagina Fáinne on Lay, which means the breaking of the day. And he composed this with, we think, a group of other immigrants. And it outlines the challenges of having left an island, which as you saw a picture of earlier, surrounded by nature and the ocean, and then going to work underground in the mines. And the song is a concise, evocative, really evocative depiction of that transition. And it goes something like this. I'll read a small piece of you in Irish and English. So, Tokit Shis do the topic, go hand up with his wife that say, his tour of ditch solution no hara, kasor no tour of yog bay, and go mashing for more than her bara, is a upper the power and air. Is the hula the smooth the kit of hala, her maja to fall in and lay. So they would take you down quickly away from the brightness and sight of life. And they would give you a shovel or cart, hammer, or a small blunt axe. The machine is high above at the top, and it is working with the power of air. And it's soiling your eyes with smoke at the break of day. Sean also wrote a number of poems about Irish political and cultural circumstances in Ireland. And here on this slide, we have an excerpt of one of his poems called On Dáil Éireann. Anybody know what On Dáil Éireann is? It's the Irish parliament in Ireland, and it's all referred to just as On Dáil Éireann. And in this piece, he celebrates the practical steps that were being taken at home in Ireland in 1918, from onwards, to bring about the establishment of an Irish parliament. And this piece is a vivid reenactment of hearing reports about an electoral victory in Ireland by a group of advanced nationalists. And Sean hopes the new assembly will redress past injustice and return the Irish language to its exalted position in his home country. So here are some verses from there, and I'll read a couple of the lines and then give you the English. So it starts off, Majin air Freshman Ail of Shatula Limakri Bahan. The Red Devil Air of the Gowner Air is Chanka Aver Harishbir Kuibas. So one morning after sleeping, I heard the news which delighted my heart that De Valera was the chief of Ireland and Hebrew's language was once again held in esteem. When I heard the words as clearly being read to me, I jumped quickly and vigorously and gave thanks to the king of the sun that Sinn Féin had defeated those dirty drinks. <laughs> <laughs> so quite, you know, he was pretty nation, right? <laughs> So the majority of Irish immigrants to youth, male and female, grew up in Irish-speaking areas in Ireland, and they were immersed in Irish tradition. And some, such as Seamus and Werner, Dick Charles French, who I mentioned, they were already collecting songs or displaying interest in songwriting before they even left Ireland. And then on the other hand, it appears that people such as Sean and others began preserving and cultivating their language once they arrived here. And these Irish immigrants' collections represent the production of the working class people, and they form what is really a unique body of documentary evidence, which just by its own existence, it offers an alternative view, view of youth history, right, as just a mining political town. And it's reasonable to argue that the Irish people's mobilization in the early days to preserve and promote their Irish language and culture this really provided them with a creative avenue in which they could express their desires for an independent gay garden back home. And their writings really do shed light on the cultural richness that also was prevailing right around amongst the organizations here in youth in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And while some of that oral tradition of singing declined post World War I, there has been a revival right, of Irish language and culture in youth over the last few decades. And that is in thanks to the community and to community organizations. So for example, the Friends of Irish Studies, who I came here a few weeks ago to teach Irish language within town, right? They run Irish immersion programs, and they hold them during the summer and throughout the year. And the Irish Studies program at the University of Montana and train up over job. They bring musicians and scholars from Ireland to Montana to share the culture, right? Um, and of course, you're abused, right? Montana Gay and Cultural Society. Right? He was hosting this event this weekend, right, on Free World. Another great example of celebrating Irish songs and culture. And the Montana Gaelic Cultural Society also holds a language immersion weekend too. And so 
So I just want to say thank you very much to the Ugly Girl Committee for inviting me to come here today and speak amongst a great panel of other speakers here as well to kick off the festival. And before I just quite finish up, Helen had a great idea of bringing down a few objects from the Sean O'Sullivan collection in the archives. And I'm just going to give this out as well to just pass out because it's a, a text that um, we just wanted to share with you, which is a, a, a it's not a song, right? But it's an interesting piece of text. So it's a, actually a charm. And so, yeah. So Sean's son, Father Sarah, who I mentioned earlier, he joked that the Irish came into the US, the only thing they were not about to smoke in was the Catholic faith. <laughs> and so, and it's very true, right? So by 1901, the four largest Catholic parishes in Butte had a combined membership of 25,000 people, right? So when the Irish came here, they felt right at home to practice their Catholic faith. And so they brought with them, as well as language, culture, songs, they brought devotional customs with them as well. And one of them is what you have in your hand, which is called the Lower Home. And Father Saris, Sean's son, printed numerous copies of this pocket-sized Lower Home, and then he laminated them and then presented them to friends and parishioners. And what it is, is the opening passage of the fourth gospel, which functions kind of like a charm against all evils. And it was used widespread in Ireland in early medieval and modern and in medieval and early modern Christian tradition. And while other gospel passages were held to be powerful and holy in, and holy in their own right, the most frequently encountered scriptural quotation in written charms or amulets was this opening passage that you have there in the fourth gospel. And usually written on a scrap of parchment of paper, it was usually folded down and covered and hung around the person's neck. And the earliest Irish reference to the use appeared to be in an 11th century tale. And it was used widespread throughout Ireland until the 19th century. And so on the piece that you have, it's an Irish text on one side, and I think on the one that he printed that is a translation and brief explanation of its significance in Irish tradition on the other. So for example, in Ireland, it was used as a substitute for the Holy Eucharistic, which the Irish could not often get in Ireland. Or a priest or a head school, head school teacher would write it out for a family for various pieces. So that's what they would do with this little piece. They would write it out for a family who's in need. So a mother that might, might bless a, chick, a sick child with it, or it could serve as a source of comfort for a dying person. So it's a small, but a little, um, a small artifact, I guess, or charm, but just it's got a lot of weight behind it. So we just wanted to share that with you So thank you all very much for having me here.
This is a good example of Catholic instinct, or what theologians call uh, census Catholicus. With respect to uh, Irish resistance to World War I, do you know what percentage of the Irish vote went for Jeanette Rankin who actually voted against the war? Mm -hmm. No? I don't. Okay. I don't. That's a great question, though. Mm -hmm. I know, and it's such an interesting, because it's, it's an interesting perspective, right? And it's that one issue, and it's really complicated. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a hard thing to even talk about a lot of the time, too, but it was a reality for a lot of people at the time. Um, that's a really good question. I don't know if the percentage part is going to be that would be a really funny to look into, though. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, except for Sean O'Sullivan, Miller O'Sullivan's that came from there on Trump the O. Do you know why? There were a lot of Irish who did that. <laughs> Anybody know why they would have done that? It's actually huh? Exactly. Yep, a lot of that all often gave away a lot of the time that they, they were Irish. But they came to Irish group. They did, but they also, oftentimes they would have stopped in the East Coast or maybe other towns in America too, and it was a way to fit in sometimes too. It was just easier, and then sometimes also we've seen in the past where Irish like Irish people's second names when they came into the US as sports country, they were often, when they would say their names out loud, the person would just document their name quite differently what their actual name was. So oftentimes they would just leave things out as well. My great auntie Grindelwald was here in the early part of this last century, and um, they used to use a church. They had a boarding house in Mount Alaska. They were one of the owners of the boarding houses. And I'm wondering, they used to use the term of Obeen, and they could have breakfast. Is that a Ishparnard. 
Inish Barn, and it comes from an Irish, uh, three Irish words, Inish Barn Ord, which is the Island of High Enclosures. So, like you saw in that picture there, it wasn't a lovely, you know, <laughs> fertile uh, island, it was kind of rocky, right? Yes. Um, so, I know that bluegrass in the south comes from sorry, comes from uh, Irish indentured servants playing with uh, slaves on plantations. What was the effect of the Irish immigrants here in the music that then sprang up from Montana, so to speak, the way that bluegrass sprang up in the south? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. When they first came, it was pretty traditional music, right? But as the generations from, as it passed down from generation to generation, and then the expansion of their, of their exposure to other music traditions, there's just lots of crossover with other European and types of music with other ethnic types of community and then with other ethnic types of music and then also with just, yeah, bluegrass and different music here in the United States as well. So there's lots of fusions and you kind of see that today like with Planksty and all the different Irish groups as well that have used that. That's a lot of what happened here too. That there is still, there was still traditional Irish music but lots of crossover and, and uh, connections with other different well. The Irish people were really open to that too. They really developed really once it went from the first generation to the second generation and the third generation on. You see a lot of So the banjo comes from Africa, but was there a traditional Irish instrument that made the banjo because it went so well with the Irish music? Like the um, not Irish traditionally. Music. So it's usually the traditional Irish instruments are usually like the flute, the whistle, and the fiddle. Uh, the baron would have been like a, you know the like gold skin drum that would have been a traditional one, but there wasn't really a traditional guitar type. Okay. Yeah, but that again would have been a, a later addition into Irish music. <coughs> okay. Yeah.